shall know that we are of truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments, and we do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. This is God's word. You may be seated. Thank you, Jensen. How are we doing this morning? Quite a few new people, so if you do, a special welcome from us pastors. We're glad that you're here. We know church is a big step of faith for a lot of us, either for the first time or just maybe getting back into church. So we're glad that you're here. Hopefully you feel welcome, as Chris just said, but also uh, encouraged by the Word of God. So we are talking about confidence today. Here's the question that sort of just popped up with the first reading of this, and it's the question that has stayed throughout all the studies that I sent you this morning. How does a Christian grow in confidence? How does a Christian, follow to Jesus in this room, not everyone in this room would claim to be a Christian or says they're a Christian, I get that, but how do us who say we follow Christ grow in confidence? And what's maybe unique about that struggle, that tension for Christians versus just confidence in general in this world? Here's one way to see it. Jonathan Edwards, very famous American preacher, preached through all these awakenings, did stuff that all, some of us can only dream of. One of his most famous sermons, the sinners in the hands of an angry God. It's intense. The image he gives is of a spider dangling over a fire. That being those of us who have sin in our life who have not repented. And you preach it with fire and brimstone and all that stuff that a lot of us are just kind of like taken back by. One of his lines in there is this. Almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he will escape it. He will depend on himself for his own security. He flatters himself in what he has done, this line is just, in what he is doing now and what he intends to do. What's man's answer to the sin problem? Flattering himself. He preached his sermon, and here's what happened. Lots of people became Christians. And it just spread. 1741. 1746, one of his most famous works, if not his most famous, is called Religious Affection. And it's a book written to those who are struggling to know if that faith is real in them. So just because you hear the greatest sermon in the world from Jonathan Edwards, the mouth of the American preacher, it comes out, you hear it, you respond in faith, you start following, there's still a need, five years later, two years later, ten years later, to read a book called Religious Affections to secure your heart and to grow your confidence that you are truly his. How does a Christian grow in confidence? Confidence is, like in parenting, this has been one of the more interesting. Just my job in stewarding and cultivating the confidence in each of my kids. Because there's obviously a way it goes off and leads to ungodly things. There's also a very real sense, like in the world we live in, kids need confidence. And their primary source initially is from their parents. And it's our job to give them confidence. And their <coughs> intellect and their emotional ability and their relational ability and their state. Our job is to give them confidence. Now here's what I know about me. I'm a very average dad. And if I spend a decent amount of my time thinking about my kids and building up their confidence, how much more does our Heavenly Father, who is perfect, think about building up our confidence in this world in ways that are helpful and true and right and in line with His will? That's what the sermon is. The Apostle John knew we needed confidence. We as parents know our kids need confidence. And God Himself knows we need Confidence. How do we grow confidence? Right, the sermon is simple. It breaks down pretty simply. And for Bryce Hill, if he's in the room, it's all peace because he loves the alliteration. Peace from God, prayers to God, and the presence of God. Why do I do that? Because it's easy to remember. If I had different letters, none of you would remember my sermon tomorrow when you woke up, I guarantee you. But 3% of you will remember that tomorrow, I guarantee you. <laughs> so let's pray. The goal is not to remember peace. The goal is to grow in confidence. So that's what I want to ask God to do. Let's pray. God, we all walk in here with our own story, our own inner monologue going on. And God, most of us uh, keep it closer to the chest than uh, we'd like to admit. And we don't let on what's really going on. So we're aware that in this room there are people who need confidence. Not in a trite way, but in a substantial way. 
from you as their Heavenly Father. So that's what we ask, that you do what this text says can happen. You grow our confidence. Do that this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's what we're doing. How do we go in confidence? I just want to make a note on the front end, just to, because oftentimes people jump into the Word and they kind of forget, like, how this came to us and why this is here. God gave this to us through divinely inspired authors who were filled with the Holy Spirit to write down. But here's what I know. If this is all about the fact that we struggle with confidence, that tells me that's a normal thing in the Christian life. So normal that it had to be written as the, one of the first letters given to the early church. Here's what the struggles in your church when we get the sexual sins and the money sins and the marital issues, like, oh, for sure. But also, confidence and assurance is a major issue, so much so that it's in the book. Second thing I get from this, God's heart. It's not a problem so small and trivial to God that he's not even going to address it. You're going to say, I see it in you. And I want to address it. I'm going to give my Apostle John the words to give to you. So just know, like the heart of God is behind this text. And here's the first thing we want to see is peace of God that we get. Let's read verse 19 and 20 together. Jansen already read it, but by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. A few things. What does John say is the problem? Why is he saying this is a problem? And what's John's solution to this problem? The first is, what is the problem John is addressing? And we can get at just by simply defining some of the words that are repeated here. The word heart is all over this. By, sh- by this we shall know that we are the truth. We are sure our heart before him. Whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. So the key word there would be heart. What is heart, according to the text? In an American sense, when we think of heart, it's sort of the emotional, romantic pulls and ups and downs of our inner life, mostly towards relationships. The Jewish concept of heart is much more holistic. It's your mind, it's your will, it's your gut, it's your heart, it's everything. I would call this your inner voice. Your heart, your inner Voice. Here's the way I wanted to say it, just so we all understand. Your inner coach, your inner cheerleader, and your inner critic. When you hear heart, think inner coach, inner cheerleader, inner... the voice inside of me that's telling me this, that's warning me of this, that's beating me down with this. Your heart is what is being addressed here. And what do we want? He says we want our hearts to be reassured. That word in Greek is persuade. So John's saying our inner voice needs to be persuaded. Why? Because it says there's condemnation, verse 22, because they, whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. What is condemning? This is very fascinating. The word literally condemn means in this text to know against. So the whole point of John is that we would know. Condemn is to know against. It's pushing back against that which John is trying to do, that we would know the Lord, know his Son, know his Spirit, know love, and condemn is that that is knowing against. It's pushing against that which we know. Our inner voice needs persuading. Why? Because our inner voice is going against us, against God, against the gospel, against truth. Even if you're like the most optimistic man in the world, There is an inner voice in you that is knowing against that which Scripture wants you to know. Now, why is John addressing this? Why is he saying this to this context here? Very simply, Xavier said this, Sandy said this, and I'll say it again just so we remember. There is bad theology circulating in this day and age. It would be Gnostic in nature. Here's here's a better way to think about it. Secret. There's these group of Christians who have been raised up, and they have a teaching now where they say, the way to really know God, to know what you're supposed to know, is this secret. There was a book a while back about the secret. Same thing. How do you know God? It's a secret. Christianity is the worst kept secret in the world. It's abundantly clear. Our leader was killed on a public Roman cross for all to see. 
and then it was recorded for all to hear and to believe. There is no secret here. The Gnostics were wrong. There was bad theology. And people are being tricked into thinking, like, what would happen in this room? There'd be people who had cousin had turned to this Gnostic stuff. And you guys read dinner on Sunday. I'm like, yeah, the Jesus stuff is good, but it's too simple. Like, right? Like you just trust Jesus and then I found a better way. And you talk about this mysterious secret thing that's nebulous that you can't really attain. And there's something nice about something that doesn't like land here on earth. It's less convicting, it's less harsh, but it's also less saving. And that's what's happening. They have a bad theology. Now, what about us? Do we still have bad theologies going on now in this room? Absolutely. There's obviously the cultish, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormon theologies that are just fundamentally wrong in the person of Jesus, the way of salvation, the nature of sin, and the Bible and what it is. But just to like dress us in this room, here's sort of what bad theology looks like in terms of the background. Here's just something that hit me, I saw it probably 10 years ago. So here's the Christian life. Time, 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 you're good. And then at some point or some season of life, there is a conversion moment where the light bulbs go on and you see Jesus in sin for what they are. Jesus is the Savior, sin is the problem, and you as more in the problem than in the right. And you're converted then what does it mean to grow? It does not mean you now have this ticket that you're waiting for heaven and you're going to punch it one day and all this timeline doesn't matter. What begins to happen is you start to grow in awareness of God's holiness. As you read his word, as you encounter his church, and there's this bigness of God that's happening to you that was not there prior. At the same time, there's this like downward slide as you grow in your awareness of your flesh and your sinfulness. Any parents in here? Like parenting does a lot of good stuff. One of the good things that none of us signed up for was I see I am a sinner. I like me a lot. I love me a lot. And these kids are getting in the way of me loving me. The Bible would say that's called sin, Joshua. That's, so this is how. So the goal would be as you walk along and God's holiness grows and your awareness of sin grows, your view of Jesus just gets bigger and bigger. That's not what happens natural. Here's the next slide. Here's what happens. Is your view of Jesus kind of stays elementary. And then you have this gap. You hear a sermon, sinners in the hands of an angry God or something like that. Or you see your sin or your sin is presented to you or something like that and there's this gap now. And what do you do with that? You fill it in with versions of performing, legalistic, churchiness, or pretending, which is the culture we live in. We just like, that's not that big a deal. And here's what happens. You may go to heaven one day. First John would say, ah, I wouldn't be so sure. But you may. But your cross is the same size as the day you got in. The goal is to fill it in more and more with Jesus and the gospel and truth, which is not our natural bent. This is why John is writing this. We struggle, and we doubt ourselves, and we don't know if we're saved. Well, what do we fill it in with? Here's what John would say. Let's just go back to the verse here. <clears throat> verse 19. By this we shall know that we are the truth. By this we gain confidence. Here's my question. What's the this? Because all this confidence hinges on why? Here's what John's been doing. He's been building this argument. It's a very cyclical argument, but he keeps repeating themes, and he kind of builds on itself. When he says, by this, he's wanting you to look back at what we just talked about last week. So go back to verse 16. By this, so let's just read it with this in context. By this, verse 16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Where does John want us to get confidence and peace from God by this fact that Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for others. Essentially, when you are lacking in confidence, you maybe more than likely have forgotten the love Christ has for you. 
in your view, the cross has shrunk. That's the first thing. We need to grow in our awareness of the gospel. We need to make the gospel language. The gospel is foreign to all mankind. The fact that there is a God who would come in and do the work for us is not natural to how humans think. It is a foreign language. We have our Spanish congregation who meets here after the, the second service. Why do they come here? Because it's in Spanish, a lot of their native tongues. And more importantly, a lot of their heart language. I don't speak Spanish. My five-year-old speaks Spanish. He knows it. Adios. <laughs> and Doritos, I said. One out of two ain't bad. <laughs> Little man. But my heart language is English. I don't know what yours is. A lot of English in here. Some others. None of us, our natural heart language is the gospel. That Jesus did that what we could not. There is no more earning we just received. The gospel is a foreign language. We rest in this. Jesus Christ died for my sins. Not just the cute ones that are easy to share at men's Bible study. But the gross ones that have had stuff forever. He died for that. Rest in that. I was watching an Angels game the other day. It was the All-Star. Shohei Otani, if you're a sports fan, you know, if you don't know. I don't even know if we could be friends. But Otani is the best baseball player in the world, maybe of all time. He pitches and he hits. He's leading the league in home runs and leading the league in pitches. And he had a great game. He pitched and he hit home runs in the same game. And he asked him, what do you do? Like, what is it? What is your, how do you do this? And here with Otani's answer, I sleep a lot. I sleep a lot through his interpreter. They're like, you, I want to ask you, let me rephrase the question. You are so amazing during the game. When you're not in the game, like, what are you doing? Interpreter, I sleep. I sleep a lot. And there's a spiritual reality to the fact that the best Christians, the most influential, impactful, deeply rooted Christians, sleep well in the gospel. They rest. They lay their head down on the gospel of Jesus Christ that he laid down his life for you. The, street, the striving is over. By this we will grow in confidence as we lay our head down on the gospel truth. But John doesn't leave it at that. He says, Jesus laid his life down for you and you lay your life down not for others. So here's the other part, of it, the harder part of this point. How do you grow in confidence and awareness of Jesus' love for you primarily? <clears throat> But then on the same side of the flip over the coin, he says, also, you grow in confidence as you see yourself laying your life down for others. In other words, you see love in your life. You don't see church talk, theology talk, Bible knowledge, church attendance, giving. You see love, sacrificial love for the sake of others. In your home, in your work, in your neighborhood. This is why church is so important. And I get that sounds, I'm the pastor, i got to say that. But community, where else are you going to come and hear a group of people affirm you in what you're doing as you're struggling to see any progress in your life whatsoever? Like, I feel like the same pathetic dude that showed up here three years ago. When you show up to Men's Bible, say you show up to your RC, your small group, you show up on Sunday, and you're like, I see love. And John says, by that, your hearts will be reassured. And that condemning, that knowing against will be worked against by the God who knows everything and speaks life into you as you rely on the love of Jesus and love for others. That's the first thing, because we get peace from God as we look at love. But here's the second thing we get. Prayers for God. And I would say this. Bold prayers. Let's read verse John 3, 21 through 23. So he continues the argument now. 21 says, Beloved, just pause, just a reminder, Beloved is like his sweet tone. The message says, friends, dear friends. Like, just remember, God loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus calls you friend if you're in him. And now the Apostle John, Jesus' best friend, is writing to you to church, and the tone is, Beloved, dear friends. Verse 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name 
of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. What are we talking about now? Prayer. Francis Chan, some of you know, famous-ish pastor in certain circles, very intense. Let's take him or leave him. But he said one thing one time that I'll never forget. Somebody asked him about dating. He has a bunch of kids. How do you help your daughters and sons think through dating? He says, I give him one question. You ask that person, how good the baby is. How much church he's gone to. How many, how many hours he spent serving the Lord. Tell me about the last prayer that God answered for you. Because if that boy or that girl doesn't have an active prayer life, they got no part of being with you. And some of you are like, Ew. But John says, if you are confident, if you have the confidence given you by God, Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments. That is an intense passage. Whatever we ask, we receive. What's he talking about? Talking about prayer. Talking about Francis Chan says. Now, what prayers of yours have been answered recently? This could become a guilt trip real quick. It's not the goal. Just a time to self-reflect. Here's some reasons why your prayers aren't being answered. You actually aren't praying. You're just kind of thinking about stuff. You are praying, but God isn't answering the way you want, which I think is a lot of the pain points in the room. Or, you are praying for stuff that won't ever get answered the way you are asking. So here's the second foundation of a common child of God. What do your prayers reveal about you and Do they reveal a bold confidence or something else? Again, let's read how John says it. Verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Now, John, tell us what we do with that confidence. Because as I pray for my kids, as I parent my kids, and I want to fill them up with confidence, that that's my goal. My goal is not for them to walk out the cockiest kid at Shea Middle School. I want something better than that. What does John want for us? Verse 22, he goes right to our prayer life. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. I wrote this, our confidence before the Lord will bring the fruit of a bold prayer life. Like John does not nuance this at all. Our hearts need reassurance because there's condemning, there's stuff going against us, our inner voice is working against us. As we rely on the gospel of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ, and live that love out in the relationships God has placed us in, there will be a boldness and a confidence shown through your prayer. So whatever you ask, he will give. Just, here's the words. Whatever we ask, we receive from him. I just want to state the obvious. That's like one of the craziest things you'll hear. Maybe ever. Maybe out of the whole Bible. Whatever you ask, we receive from him. And that can do, if you truly embrace that, live that, could create such a faith story in your life that you never you could also grab hold of that in unhealthy and untruthful ways and really sidetrack and derail your faith. That's just, that's, some of you come from a more like charismatic background where it's like, big prayers. Like this can do some damage. So I just want to caution us before we jump in and try to see what, what is John saying? In our prayer world, in our Christian subculture in America here, we've got this spectrum of prayer. We've got the pointlessness of prayer, and we've got the prosperity-ness of prayer. Pointlessness is the air we all breathe. When you all go to work tomorrow, you turn on your Zoom as you're putting on your shorts right before the bell rings, and dink, and you're there in the Zoom meeting with the other software people. <laughs> the air in that company, on that team, is not one of the dependence on a holy God to do anything in life. It's... Prayer is pointless. If 
philosopher named Taylor wrote this book that none of us will ever read called The Secular Age. It's like this big, and the words are even bigger than the book somehow. It's like, but his point is this, his thesis is this, the transcendence of God has been squeezed out by the secular age of living. And now the most natural thing to believe is that there's no way there's a transcendent thing going on, whatever you want to call it. It's secular world. We can blame the Democrats or the Republicans or the youth or all of them. But it's just the air we breathe. So prayer, we wake up tomorrow in a world that does not feed that in us. On the other side, you get into church and there's this other spectrum called prosperity. Where prayer is like this magic, but you have enough faith. And you just pray. God will do it. You just know that's equally painful hurtful, and not helpful. Personal story. I have a brother, I have lots of siblings, regular step, half. Well, my half-brother, we have the same mom, raised in different homes, though. And our mom got a terminal illness. She became a Christian somewhere in that season. And she would pray, God, take this from me. And she got into a charismatic sort of space. I'm praying with my faith that this is going to be taken from me. I'm praying that this is going to be taken from me. I'm praying that this is going to be taken from me. I'm 17 years old, she dies. But that very illness she had been praying for life. I'm raised in a different house. My brother's raised in that house watching his mom pray in faith to people promising that something would happen that never happened. There's a spectrum we fall on in this prayer life. Pointless, or like God is just here to fix whatever my thing is. <clears throat> Health, kids, money. And that is not what John wants us to leave with. He wants us to leave with a robust vision of prayer. And I just want to read it again and just unpack some key phrases here. Verse 21. If our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Here's the formula for prayer, old prayer that I get from this. There is a confidence. Where does that confidence come from? The preceding verses. Knowing the gospel. Some of you walking in this room have zero confidence or the most unshaky confidence in God because you're not a Christian yet. And you've never put your faith in this beautiful message of salvation that Jesus did all the work for you. All your sins are completely forgiven. He's given you his righteousness. Heaven is taken care of. Your day to day is taken care of. You are 100% secure in his love. You only get that through the gospel. You can't work your way to that. That's where we get confidence. But then there's also dependence. The word here is we ask. Old prayer comes because I say in my neediness no matter how many degrees I have or retirement accounts I have, I say I need like, how many of you need God to show up tomorrow, next week, next month, or next year to do anything substantial in your life? Or would you be just fine without him showing up? That's the problem. Dependence. We, we're, we have such a big vision for life that we need him to show up. The other thing is obedience. How do you describe it? If we obey his commandments. What are his commandments that we believe in the name Jesus Christ? We're repeating there. Trust the gospel and love one another. Back to the Gnostics. There's nothing secret about this faith. It's pretty simple. It's deep and profound, but it's simple. Believe Jesus is who he says he is. Love one another. Do you obey him? And I just want to say, the Bible, the scariest passages for me as a man are about prayer and obedience. First Peter says this to husbands. Live with your wives in an understanding manner. If not, your prayers will be hindered. So like, here's the test. I go knock on your door. Can I talk to your wife, please? <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, one is you guys aren't even speaking the same language or the same universe. Ten is she gets you better than you've ever been understood in your entire life. How are you doing? The answer to that question is tied to your prayer life and tied to God's ability and desire to answer your prayers, husband. We can go on a men's retreat and do lots of bro stuff, but if we leave there, we're husbands. We are screwed. James says it this way, a little more positive way. The prayers of a righteous man availeth much, the King James says. The prayers of a righteous man, a righteous woman, are effective 
and accomplishing what they ask. How is your obedience? If, right now, if there's something in your head that's popping in like, this is what he's talking to me about, and you're like, I wonder, yes. God's saying that's what we're talking about. So before you go get on your knees and ask for that thing again, take care of this. This. I don't know what it is. I don't even need to know. God knows it already. He wants you to do that so that your prayers may be full. And then finally, trust. I love how he says, uh, do any commands, leave them in the hands, believe it. We have confidence before God. Whatever we ask, we receive it because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. In other words, there is a will of the Father in heaven, and it's our desire more and more to get in line with that will. That's where bold prayer comes from. Like some of the sweetest conversations I have are with older saints who have like such a simplified view of their relationship with the Lord and the stuff of this earth. And it's like, I want the spirit, I want to love well, and I want to finish well. In other words, I want to do the will of my Father. It takes time to get there. But bold prayer comes from those four people. We've got the peace of God, we've got the prayers of God, and finally we'll end here. We've got presence from God. Here's the question I want you to end your time with this morning. How close does your theology let you get to God? There's an answer to that question. Every religion has an answer to that question. Every worldview has an answer to that question. And you have an answer to that. How close does your theology let you get to God? Let's just see how John ends it. John, this beautiful author, this is the first time he brings up the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit, and this phrase, which is just mind-blowing for a Jewish person hearing this for the first time. Verse 24. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. I just want to read that list. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Up to this point, Xavier, Sandy, and myself have had the word abide show up almost every sermon. And it's all been said this way, abide in him, abide in his word, abide, abide. The onus on us to abide in God. This is the first time the Apostle John says, and God abides in you by the spirit whom he has given us. How close does your theology let you get to God? Because John has a very clear offensive answer right here. Here's the modern day answer in our secular world. And, most, and this is not like I'm trying to poke, I'm just trying to let us see the landscape for what it is. Like most people are okay with God as long as he's practical and helpful to what I'm wanting to do now. That's modern day religion. So you may have neighbors who call themselves Christian or you might be one of these people, but a lot of times Christian simply means when I'm in need or when I think he's useful, I bring God into the equation and I am a Christian. But most of the time, I set them on the shelf because I'm just fine. So modern answer, how close does God get to us? As close as our practical needs allow, which is not all that often. Or that beautiful of a love story written by God to us. Like, think about you parents. Your kids, as they get older and older, they call you, they interact with you as you're useful to their ends. You being a good parent and maybe being a Christian full of spirit will continue that relationship, but it's not what you want. Spouses, same thing. No relationship in the world exists like that, except for modern day religion where we take God into the center when he's useful. The Jewish and the religious answer, Muslims have a much more holy view of God. It's not that we bring him in just when he's useful. It's we're never even able to get into his presence because we are so unholy. Like our Muslim friends have no concept of the verse we just read. Or some idea of an like incarnation, a God coming close, it blows their mind. They have no category. The Jews had no category. Here was their category. The closest anyone could get to God was the high priest. And if you've been around church, you've heard this story. Once a year, the high priest could go in the Day of Atonement and go into the Holy of Holies. Picture this big Washington, D.C. type building. And they walk in 
and they go all the way to the Holy of Holies. There's a few things going on. There's bells on their thing, and there's a rope tied to them. And the bells are on them because if that high priest goes sideways at all, veers from the commands and the ways that God wants him to enter his presence, he is dead. And they have to pull that dead body off and wait another 365 days for a man to go into the presence of God. I'm like, how do Jews see that moment? Like, what do Jews think that who have not converted to Christianity? And I found one guy, and this, he finds a more beautiful picture, although it falls far short of what the gospel gives us. Here's what one man said. Next one. Because of the sound of the bells on the high priest, there apparently is heightened spiritual experience resulting in a one-on-one -on -one encounter with the divine. Not only for Moses, who did it first, and the high priest respectively, but also for the rest of the Jewish people, who at best can only fantasize what such an experience might entail. Translation. If you are like a committed Jew, the best you have for how close your theology lets you get to God is standing near the temple and hearing the ringling of bells and fantasizing about what it might be like to be in the presence of God. That's as close as you get if you don't flip over after the Old Testament ends and get to now. What's the gospel say to us? And by this we know that he abides in us and by the spirit whom he has given. How close does your theology let you get to God? The gospel flips. It says, how close does God get to you? John would say, he is in you by his spirit. How much more confidence do you need? The holy God of Israel, the creator of the universe, the one holding every star in its place by the word of his power is residing in you and in me by his spirit. How much more confidence do you need? That's the gospel. How close is your theology to get? Closer than we deserve. We deserve to be on the outside looking in. We deserve to be on the outside of the temple just listening in to the bells and fantasizing as that high priest went in and sprinkled blood everywhere for the atonement of sins. Why do we deserve to be looking on from the outside? Because the problem that the priest was in there for is still here. It's sin, rebellion against God, and lack of love for others, period. That's the most simple way to say it. That sin problem is still in every heart in this room. The only thing that's changed is the high priest, the Bible would say. We have a better high priest who didn't need to wear bells to be heard. He got on a cross to be seen. And he breathed his last. And in that moment, died. John says, lay down his life for us. Why? So that we could have a relationship with him. And not just be close to him, but that he could be close to us. The author of Hebrews says this, Therefore, church, we have confidence now to enter the places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain in the temple, that is, through the flesh. And since we now have a great priest over the house of God, here's his charge, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from our evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. How close does your theology let you get? Christians, here's your answer. Closer than you deserve. He is in you right now. And it's the most mysterious part of the Christian faith for me to grapple with. But just because it's mysterious does not mean I do not hold on to it as foundational truth to my life. How confident are you right now, Christian? As you leave out here, go choose where you're going to have brunch and lunch and spend your week. Here's what the Bible would say. You could have peace from God by remembering the love of Jesus for you that is satisfactory and perfect. And you can have bold prayers as you enter in that confidence and ask God for whatever in his name, in his will, and he will answer you. And finally, you can be confident because of this. The presence of God is not up there or out there or in some religious institution. It's in you, simply by grace, given by Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together.
Father, we love you. Uh, we want to be more confident, sure, grounded, rooted. And God, there's a million reasons why our hearts condemn us. So thank you for your word that tells us how to deal with the inner voice that is working against your life-giving word. In your truthful word. In your everlasting word. So God, I just pray for the room that your spirit would do what he needs to do in our hearts so that we would actually leave here more confident. That this week we would live more confident that our inner voice would reflect that, that our prayer life would reflect that, and that our awareness of your closeness to us would reflect that. So God, continue to grow our confidence, even as we sing and edify each other with our voices. We love you. Christ in your prayer.